Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our program this afternoon. I'm Ann Nickel with the United Nations Association of New York. And today we have a very special and unique program for you. Clarissa Ward is the Chief International Correspondent for CNN, and we're extremely pleased to have her with us today. She will have a conversation with Lucy Westcott, Emergencies Director at the Committee to Protect Journalists, an organization that protects the free flow of news and takes action wherever journalists are under threat. Clarissa is going to talk about her recent book, on All Fronts, The Education of a Journalist, a compelling look at several decades of her work as a foreign and war correspondent. And after we, the conversation, we will have time for your questions. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to turn over the proceedings to Lucy and a very warm uh, welcome to you both. Thank you very much, Anne, and thank you to the United Nations Association of New York City for having us here today and for hosting this event and for all of you, to all of you for joining. So again, my name is Lucy Westcott. I am the Emergencies Director at the Committee to Protect Journalists. We are joined here today by Clarissa Ward to speak about her book, On All Fronts, The Education of a Journalist, which you can see just behind me. Uh, Clarissa has received Emmy, Peabody and Murrow Awards for her work and she has recently returned from South Sudan where she covered the human cost of biblical flooding in the country. Clarissa, who is the mother to two sons, is based in London. Clarissa, thank you so much for being here with us today and for writing such an exciting, inspiring and adventurous book. Uh, my team at CPJ is responsible for ensuring the safety of journalists globally. And this is something that Clarissa uh, writes about extensively in her book. Um, Clarissa, you've reported from many of the countries that are featured on CPJ's annual prison census, which was public, uh, published last week. And just to highlight how dangerous the job of a journalist can be, um, China, you've reported from China where there are currently 50 journalists in prison, from Russia where there are 14 journalists in prison, and Iran, where there are currently 11 journalists in prison, just to name a, a few countries. And before we start, Clarissa, um, I'd like you to know that I held up your book recently uh, on a Zoom talk I was giving for a journalism class uh, here in New York. And not only did the professor say, wow, I'm reading that book. Um, there was also a student who popped in the Zoom chat and said, I'm reading that book too. <laughs> so your book is already being uh, hoovered up in universities, so thank you again. So um, Clarissa, I'm gonna start with quite a broad question. So I was struck um, by your decision to frame your book as an education. And as I was reading it, um, I saw this both as a story about the education of yourself as a journalist, um, as you took on assignments around the world, but also as a guide and an educational tool for the journalists who are reading this and who will read this book. So can you tell us why you chose the framing of an education, please? There we go. It's really sad. Yes, it's, it's almost as if I haven't done this before. Um, and I've been like babbling away as well while you've been doing that intro and being like, oh, thank you, but on mute, but which is probably for the best. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you, um, Anne, for, for having me here today with all of you. It's really great to be here. I think when I started writing the book, I didn't really know um, what form it was going to take. I just started out with this idea. I was pregnant with my first son and I really wanted him to have a better sense at some point when he was a little bit older of who I am beyond being mom and what my life has been about and choices I've made and risks I've taken. And then as I started to write it, it became clear that it was also kind of this love letter to journalism, really, and to all the people whose paths I've crossed along the way. And, you know, I think sometimes people don't realize this, but a very small fraction of what you experience in a war zone ends up being on the evening news. But there are all these other moments that happen behind the camera that are often profoundly moving or beautiful 
um, or touching or harrowing that never end up on the evening news. They never end up in the television. And, and, and there isn't an obvious outlet for these moments. And yet these moments are hugely instructive and really help us formulate our understanding of the world and, and different places and conflicts and cultures that we have covered. So with that in mind, I was like, okay, this is what this is. But then as I was writing it, it also became clear that this was about my evolution as a journalist. And it was really about me becoming a journalist because in the beginning, I'm sort of coveting this role, this lifestyle that I think I understand and I'm drawn towards, but I quickly realize is, is, is much different and less glamorous and much more frightening in many ways than what I had envisioned. And so, yes, it was only, I think when I was like halfway through the first draft or so that I realized that, that this was about the education of a journalist and, and, and truly coming to grips with what that means. And then a very sort of exciting byproduct of that is that I can share this with other journalists who are starting out their journey. Because I remember very vividly when I was starting out that there weren't a lot of texts out there. There were a lot of books by journalists, but not that many where they sort of were very honest about their own experiences as well and their own growth as well. And so I guess by allowing myself to be a bit more vulnerable, I hopefully have created a little bit more space to have discussions around these types of things and, and, and for journalists to have a, a slightly broader understanding going into it of, of what it entails. Thank you. Yes, it, it absolutely is a love letter to journalism. Um, and I don't want to give anything away. You should read the book, of course, but some of the most moving passages um, in your book, Clarissa, is, is when you're with the families um, that you are staying with and that are taking care of you during these massively stressful, risky uh, assignments that you're on. So, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so reading your book, it really feels like going on an adventure through the biggest news stories of the past 20 years with you acting as our trusty guide um, and, I kept, and I kept thinking the whole time how fascinating it must have been to witness these stories, not only firsthand, but as they're, as they're unfolding and to kind of be this chronicler of the world. So what drew you to journalism when you were growing up? Um, is this a job you knew you always wanted to do? And what is the first news story maybe that you remember or that really resonated with you and made you want to go into this, mm. into this career? The first news story I really remember is the crackdown in Tiananmen Square. I was about eight years old when that happened in, uh, in the late 80s. And that's the first time I remember the news. But I didn't realize that I wanted to be a journalist until much later. Um, I was in college. I was studying comparative literature. I was a senior at Yale. I thought I wanted to be an actress at the time. And I was very into languages and storytelling. And I had um, been very privileged to be exposed to different cultures. My dad had moved to Hong Kong when I was 14. I had grown up between New York and London. I had gone to boarding school with lots of other international kids. So I, I always had this sense of being a little bit of a chameleon that like I could fit in anywhere, but didn't really belong in one particular place. Um, but it was only when 9-11 happened that for me, and I think for so many people around the world and Americans particularly, it was like a slap across the face, right? Not in terms of being like insulted, but in terms of being awakened that uh, there was a whole world out there that I had only been minimally engaged with. And I really became consumed with this idea that a big part of the reason this horrifying thing had happened was because of a lack of communication, a lack of understanding of some of the undercurrents that were brewing away that maybe we weren't talking about enough and we weren't looking deeply enough into. And I felt like there was this process of, of, of miscommunication and dehumanization that I very much wanted to go to the tip of the spear. I didn't really know where that was at that stage and participate in somehow trying to improve the communication or to act as a translator between worlds. 
And, uh, you know, I obviously I was 22. I knew very little about journalism. There was a lot of hubris at play. But fundamentally, when I think about what I, why I still love this job and why I still do it, it is still rooted in that sense of this like endless quest to try to humanize um, stories that may be a million miles away from our own existence and to find this thread of, of human connection. Okay, thank you. I'm actually gonna, I was gonna ask you one question, but I'm gonna ask you a different one first um, before we get into some of the specifics of your reporting. So early on in the book, um, you say that for journalists, uh, the reality is that we are not uh, we are not there to solve the problem. We are there to illuminate it. And you know, as you've just as you've just spoken about the reasons for getting into this career um, throughout the book, you know, we know you're a journalist who cares very deeply about illuminating the world's problems. And so, how do you reckon with what feels like an unending uh, number of crises that are all going on at once that you are reporting on all the time? Um, and as well as perhaps the public's, uh, you know, the limit to the public's ability to care about them mm. um, as all these stories are happening at once. I mean, I think, first of all, you have to kind of pick a target a little bit. If you're trying to do every story and get everyone to care about everything at once, you're probably not going to go get anywhere with that tactic. Um, what I have found to be much more effective is to really kind of find a specific story that speaks to me on a, on a personal level usually because that does then really energize you and, and, and gives you that added passion that you need um, to really do justice to a story. And then I try to go deep on it and keep coming back to it. And as for the sort of people have a limited ability to engage with things that they can't solve. And I, I think that's very true, but I also think one has to be very careful because sometimes as a journalist, you get cynical and you're like, oh, nobody cares about that anymore. I don't wanna do that story anymore. And really what you should be saying is, okay, the way we have been telling that story is getting tired. We need to find a new way to look at this. We need to find a new character, a new angle, a new development. We need to move the story forward. And I try to think about it less in the sort of um, through the lens of this is the failing of the public who lack the discipline and engagement to sustain interest in this and look at it more as, OK, this is the failing of journalists to continue to make this story feel fresh and newsworthy and to make the people in it come alive and feel vivid and real to the viewer or reader or listener. That's a really good, yeah, that's a really good way of uh, thinking about it actually. Thank you. Um, so let's then move on to your reporting. So you have spent a great deal of time reporting from the Middle East, uh, including Gaza and Baghdad before reporting from Syria. And, and you were there at the beginning of the uprising and throughout the country's war. Um, and your passages from Syria are, are so illuminating, but they are terrifying because of what we know now about how dangerous it, how dangerous it was, but also still is for journalists in the country. Mm. Um, so at the start of the Arab Spring, you returned to Damascus. And you wrote that it presented a very different kind of danger to the kind you had experienced in Iraq and Afghanistan, where the biggest fear was getting blown up, as you write. So can you talk a bit about what was so different um, in terms of the danger you faced in Syria as, as a Western reporter? Yeah, well, so the first time I went to Syria after the Arab Spring, when the uprising was just sort of starting to um, gain momentum, I was the only one in my team who managed to get the visa. I, I, I got a tourism visa. I had been scouring Lonely Planet chat rooms to see if there was somewhere that was still issuing tourism visas. And I found uh, a sort of avid cyclist said that he had been able to get a visa in um, Oman. So I flew to Muscat and I applied for a visa and I actually got one, but the rest of my team did not. And that meant um, that I ended up going alone. 
So I went alone. I went, for, I posed as a tourist for two days and then I went undercover and dressed like a Syrian girl and was staying with activists and spent a week there reporting on the situation. And so the threats that I was facing were very different because I was used to facing the threats of like war and insurgency, kidnapping, but I was also used to being embedded with the US military or the, or the British military. I wasn't used to being on my own and undercover in, um, in an area that wasn't yet like a fully fledged war zone. Um, but obviously the risks were enormous, um, not even so much to me, although they were significant, but the people I was staying with, I knew that if I was, if I was captured or something, that anyone who had talked to me could be tortured or disappeared or God forbid killed. Um, and that weighs heavily on you as a journalist. It's a lot of responsibility. So I made sure when I was shooting, I shot everything myself on just like a little point and shoot tourism camera. And I, um, I had created like a, a pocket in my underwear and I sewed the memory cards into this pocket in my underwear when I was leaving the country because I figured, you know, if someone found them there, then, you know, the jig was up anyway, but that would be the last place they would find them. But every person I was interviewing, even if they said, I feel comfortable with you showing my face and you can blur it later, I didn't. I only shot people's hands um, because I was so petrified that I was going to get stopped at some point or spotted by Shabiha, like these sort of undercover thugs who would go to these protests posing as protesters and then inform on people there. Um, and even as it stands, you know, I, that first trip, I stayed with an activist. I interviewed and featured this activist, Razan Zaytune. Um, the activist who I stayed with um, was arrested about six months afterwards and has not been heard from since. Uh, Razan Zaytune was kidnapped um, in Duma back in 2012 or 2013, I wanna say, and has not been heard from since. And every single trip I have done to Syria since then, and there have been more than 10, people I've stayed with or people I've interviewed or friends I've made have ended up dead or imprisoned or tortured or you know whatever horrifying situation you can imagine. And of all the wars I've covered, I, I just have never had that experience before. The darkness in Syria, um, A, but B, the closeness with which you were able to get to it um, because there weren't like the sort of traditional rules um, of engagement were really, yeah, it was unique. Yeah. And, and you write about that so extensively. Um, and, it, and you can really feel just how, how, how very personally invested you were in that story as well. So it must have made it. Yeah. Different. Yeah. Um, we, we actually have quite a lot of questions coming in, but I'll, I'll keep doing mine and um, the Q&A will be will be busy, which is good. Um, so actually on that point, Clarissa, you know, we we learn throughout your book about all the, the different ways that you stay safe as a journalist. And we know that being a woman in this profession comes with its own challenges, but also advantages. Um, for example, you write about how wearing the hijab in some countries allows you to blend in um, and access environments that perhaps your male colleagues would not be able to, um, but how equally your status as a female journalist puts you at risk. So can you kind of take us through some of the main ways when you, when you are on assignment, when main ways that you keep yourself safe and I would say both physically and also increasingly online as well. Mm. With digital threats yeah. too. Yeah, so it's a good question. I mean, look, every war zone is different um, and every conflict or crisis has a unique set of, of threats that you need to be aware of and, and looking out for. For the most part, I think you need to be really, really organized. You need to have a great team and you need to give thought to every decision you make, which sounds like a really obvious thing, but it's not because often you'll kind of go with the flow or improvise or see what the opportunities are. And actually like with every opportunity you get or every move you make, you need to sit there and game it out. Game it out. How do I get out of here? Who am I gonna stay with? What are the risks in this place? Who do I know in this place? What's the escape route? How often can I be in communication with my bosses? 
um, back at the mothership? Will my sat phone work there? Will my regular phone work there? Can I take my body armor? Will that raise my profile? Uh, I mean, there's a thousand questions that you're asking yourself. Um, and really, you need to have experience in war zones. You need to have HEFAT training, hostile environment course um, experience. You also, you know, a lot of people don't talk about things like kidnap and ransom insurance. Um, languages uh, are very helpful. Medical experience, like there's a ton of preparation um, that you should be actively engaging in before you go to conflict zones. And granted, like in the same way that once you've flown a thousand times, you don't necessarily listen to every word of the security demonstration or the safety demonstration at the beginning of a plane ride. Once you've been doing this for near 20 years as I have, like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of it that is like muscle memory now um, that you do it automatically. Um, but it's still really important. And that's why, I mean, CNN has a process when you're in war zones that honestly can feel really laborious at times and kind of frustrating, but it's there for a reason because in every moment like that, you need to slow it down and go through it with a fine tooth comb. In terms of being a woman, I have for the most part found it to be really helpful because as you said, if I put on a hijab, like even if I don't look local, I can certainly, I will attract way less attention to myself if I'm if I'm fully covered, if I'm wearing an abaya, if I'm wearing a niqab, like no one can even see me. Um, and that's enabled me to do some pretty daring undercover work with, you know, interviewing Western jihadis in Syria that, you know, a, a male colleague just would not be able to do that uh, without putting himself, I would argue at substantially higher uh, risk. Um, it'll, it's also what allowed me when I, I was, you know, one of the first Western journalists a few years ago to go and spend time with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Um, again, um, because sometimes there is power in being underestimated, right? And so jihadists or the Taliban may kind of dismiss you because you're a woman. They may not want to look at you at all because you're a woman. Um, they may not talk to you directly or want information about you because you're a woman, you're the property of whatever man it is that you've come with. And, and, and so it, that could be infuriating on one level, but on another level, it's actually empowering because it means I'm seen as, le of, I'm seen as being less of a threat and therefore less of a sort of object of fixation. I have been able to pretend to sleep in the back of a car and drive through you know, potentially dangerous checkpoints, which again, you know, typically in some of these areas, Western men are seen as being um, mercenaries, spies, active combatants, basically. Women in war zones, you know, are often viewed with hostility as well. I don't want to pretend we don't face the same risk. We do. But we're also sometimes viewed as more of a curiosity, let's say, than a threat. With the one major caveat that we are, for the most part, more vulnerable to sexual abuse um, or sexual assault. Uh, I'm very fortunate. I've never, um, you know, I've had a couple of unpleasant situations, but I've never dealt with uh, a sexual assault as some of my female colleagues have. So I'm mindful that I don't want to downplay the risks um, because they're real. But I do think in many ways, I, I personally feel safer as a woman. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, on that note, following up, and then we'll move uh, to your question about Afghanistan. Um, does, you know, you, you, you've been doing this for 20 years, as you say, does, does confronting the danger in your job ever get any easier, um, particularly now that you have, have a young family? Um, and, it, and in your book, you write that I think... Um, uh, your husband said, you know, this isn't just about you anymore um, when you're heading out for an assignment. Mm. I mean, it, I, I understand this. It's like very hard for people. If you haven't spent time in war zones, like all of it looks incredibly dangerous. When you spend a lot of time in war zones, it is dangerous. It is obviously riskier than being in London or New York or Paris, but it's not always as dangerous as it looks from the outside. Um, and so within the context of that, I am extremely conservative about the risks that I take. 
I know that doesn't always translate when you see me on television in dangerous places or interviewing dangerous people. And it looks like I'm doing things that are really very dangerous. Um, uh, but there are many things that I won't do now that I would have done before. And there are things that I did before, which I also hated doing. And I felt absolutely petrified. There were situations in Syria where like I could barely function. I was so afraid and, and I did it and I got through it. And would I do it again though? I don't know if I could put myself through that, that level of fear again. Um, so it's a constant consideration and nothing is taken for granted. And the only other thing I would say is there's a perception often that people who do this job are adrenaline junkies, that they enjoy being in danger. Like I can tell you, I hate being in dangerous situations. I hate being shot at. I hate being in situations where there is gun, where there are gunshots even, even if they're not directed at me, like all of it makes me deeply uncomfortable. And um, I just recognize that sometimes I have to be in those situations to tell the stories of the people who are stuck there. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Clarissa. Okay, so if we could turn to more recent events. Um, in August, you covered the final days of the US presence in Afghanistan. And I know that you have said um, in interviews that you, you feel guilty because you were able to leave um, because, you know, the luck of having an American and British passport, but also thank goodness that your translator was able to, to reach the US and get to safety, which is really fantastic news. Um, and in one video that, that struck me, um, you are in the streets of Kabul and you are surrounded by um, Afghans who I believe had worked on various military bases and they were showing you all their documents and um, they were translators and they were just, they were looking for your advice on how to basically leave the country. Um, and I think at one point, even just your advice on how to enter the base. Um, mm. That's that, that was a very intense video. And, and I'm wondering if you could take us through what that most recent experience in Afghanistan was like for you, covering, covering that huge story. And four months um, into the takeover of the country by the Taliban, what do you think the future holds um, for Afghans? Mm. Um, so it was very intense. Um, it was very intense on many levels. Uh, it was chaotic. Um, no one had anticipated things happening as quickly as they had. Nobody knew what the situation was going to be in Kabul. Was there going to be urban combat, street to street fighting? Was there going to be an insurgency? Was the Taliban going to launch retaliatory attacks for people who had worked uh, with the Americans? Were they going to attack Western? I mean, there was such confusion around everything that was happening. And whenever you have confusion and chaos, you, um, you have to be very careful because it's, uh, it's, it's easy for things to go wrong and for bad people to exploit that kind of uncertainty. It was also intense on a different level. Physically, we had already been there for two weeks. We were sleeping four hours a night. The Afghan staff who worked at our house that we were staying at understandably were much too frightened to come to work, which meant that we had no food uh, really. So we were kind of like eating eggs and you know, canned foods and um, working these insane 18 hour days and um, trying to do justice to the story and to get out on the streets and, and reflect what we were seeing, but then also being very mindful that the security situation was changing every minute and we needed to be cognizant of how we were gonna get out and what were the escape routes. And so it was just like a thousand things happening at once, um, which is always very, very, very stressful, especially when the stakes are so high. Uh, when I fast forward to, and I'm just coming back to your original thing about the people outside the airport. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. Like I wanted to get out of that airport at that moment. We, we had already had a very unpleasant run in with a Taliban fighter. I had seen people being whipped. There were shots being fired. It, it was clear they were not happy we were there. But when these people started swarming around us and showing their documents and, and, and begging us in English to give some guidance, how do I get out? I worked with the Americans, I worked at this camp, here's my paperwork from this Italian company. You sort of like, okay, this is my job. I can't help these people or rather the only way I can help these people is by making sure that their voices are heard and that 
those people in positions of power and the US and various other world capitals are hearing these voices and have a sense of urgency um, that something needs to be done to help them. So, uh, but it was, it was so hard because again, you're always grappling with that sense of like, why do I get to leave? Why do I get to hop on a plane and go home and, and, and you're left in this mess and it's not a mess of your making. So um, now I look at the situation four months later and things are certainly quite a bit calmer in Kabul. Um, but it's an uneasy calm because it's not a sort of calm that results from the Taliban having announced a bunch of policies that have really alleviated people's fears. It's more that the Taliban hasn't implemented many policies that have alleviated anyone's fears, but they also haven't engaged in rampant bloodletting um, or revenge attacks on, on a kind of systematic level in the way that some people had feared. So now there's just this weird lurking unease compounded by a horrific humanitarian situation because all of this aid has been frozen because the Afghan central bank has been frozen, salaries aren't being paid, people are getting uh, hungrier and hungrier by the day. And so it's kind of a perfect storm of, of just, you know, abject poverty and horrendous living conditions on top of the, the fear that many people uh, still feel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Clarissa. One more question for you from me. Um, and then we, we will open it up to the many questions awaiting you in the Q&A. So um, you, you recently returned from South Sudan where you covered um, the horrendous flooding and the displacement of population from those floods. Um, it's a fantastic report that you did. I would encourage everyone to watch it. Um, I certainly didn't know about that situation. So thank you for illuminating a problem for me and for everyone else. Um, where do you see yourself traveling to in the next year? Mm. And which stories do you want to cover that you know you want to cover that you haven't yet? Mm. Good question. Um, I feel like next year, I really want to do more on Myanmar and what's going on there. It's very difficult because I went there earlier this year. We were the only Western journalists to go in after the coup, but obviously we did not um, ingratiate ourselves. <laughs> with the junta and as a result I, I certainly won't be able to go back on an official visa so but i am conscious of the fact that there are horrific abuses taking place there on a regular basis that i would love to see get more attention um i feel like um you mentioned south sudan i feel like i will be doing more climate change stories in 2022 for me, the challenge with climate change stories is to find things that are happening now in reality that have a human impact, that have a kind of tangible effect. It's very difficult, or one of the big challenges with, with climate change is people think of it as this like hypothetical problem in the future, in the not too distant future, but still not a sort of tangible reality on the ground. Whereas we're already seeing very clearly and disproportionately in Africa that um, states are being hugely impacted um, as a result of, of, of all the changes. So I want to keep reporting on that. And then, you know, if you talked about where I would love to go to that I can't go or I haven't gone, I mean, I lived there for two years, but I haven't been able to go back to China in a really long time. Um, it's obviously been very difficult with the pandemic. It's also much more challenging uh, as a Western journalist to get a visa these days, a journalism visa. Um, but I love China and I spent a lot of time there. And um, I think it's obviously a huge story at the moment. And I would really relish the opportunity to, to go back and, and spend some time um, digging into some stories there. Thank you. Yeah, just I from watching your report from from South Sudan, you know, you, you're literally wading in to do your interviews waist deep um, to show just how bad the flooding really was there. And, and that is a very tangible um, image to see just mm -hmm. how the climate has affected the lives of the people you interviewed. So thank you very much. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Carlo to ask you some questions from the audience. 
Thank you so much, Lucy. And thank you very much, Clarissa, for joining us today and for writing such an inspiring book. We are very honored to have you here with us today. Nice. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in. I will try and get through as many as I can uh, before uh, the end of the event. Um, so to start with, kind of going to bundle a couple of questions together because a lot of people are asking yeah. about this. How do you protect yourself um, emotionally? How do you turn off and not kind of let seeing all these painful events happen um, affect you? How do you, you know, you've spoken about protecting yourself physically. How do you protect yourself emotionally? Mm -hmm. um, it's a really important question. Um, I also just want to give a little shout out to Ames. Uh, is apparently an 11 year old fan who is <laughs> who is with us today so i just want to say hi ames i saw your message um so i think the challenge is you don't want to cut yourself off emotionally you have to in the moment to get through and do your work right like if i'm completely porous and open to the full horror of what's happening in any, any given situation at any given moment i won't be able to do my job. I won't be able to function. I won't be able to get the material we need and make sure as a team that we will get out safely. So in the moment, you are kind of like, I've compared it sometimes, although of course we're not saving lives to like a doctor in an ER where like you're in there, you've got a mission, it's carnage, but you know what you have to do. You got to get the material. I got to get the sound bites, get the pictures, get a sense of what's happening, try to understand the reality behind it, and then get everybody out safely. But you also have a responsibility, I believe, and particularly when I'm interviewing people, to really be present for them and to really be hearing them. Because we talk a lot in journalism about the idea of bearing witness. Well, you know, as I was saying before, not all of this stuff makes it onto the evening news. But I believe that part of the job is as a human being, just to, if somebody wants to tell me their story or you know, is carrying a lot of pain or trauma, I think that part of my job is to, to listen to them and not to you know, hurriedly kind of be like, you know, what's, and then what happened after your mother died? You know, like, no, not like that. Like to actually genuinely hear them and, and let them have that hopefully um, cathartic moment to feel heard. It's really important for people when you are at the lowest of ebbs and you are in pain and you are surrounded by horror and you feel about it. It is so important for people just on an emotional level to feel heard and to have an opportunity to, to say their piece. So, and also when I'm telling the story, I don't want to sound clinical or cold or like a doctor. I want to sound like a human being. And so it's this constant dance you're doing between being open enough to experience it and feel it and, and allow people to really open themselves up to you, but then also being professional enough to be focused like a laser on what the most important objectives are and on your team security, which is the most important thing. Um, and I always like carve out a little bit of time and space for myself after these trips to try to think about what I experienced or talk about it or, um, you know, the, it's different for different people. You want to do a retreat, you want to do a yoga class, you want to see your therapist, you want to pray, you want to dance, you want to drink. I mean, drinking, I wouldn't recommend as much. It's, <laughs> it's, it's fun, but it's not the best therapy. Um, so my point is that like, you have to carve out that space for yourself to try to unpack a little bit of what you've been through because, even if you don't feel it in the moment, even if you're able to power through it like a boss and kind of put on a great piece and then be like, tick, tick, we did it. The bill always comes. You're not getting through this work and doing this for years and years and seeing people at their lowest ebb and seeing children die and seeing, you know, all the worst of humanity and coming out unscathed. You're just not. I mean, if you are, you're a psychopath. So, I mean, that that's that's a possibility, but obviously most of us aren't striving for that. So it's a really important part of the job to like be constantly navigating that line of like 
opening yourself up to the experience, but being professional and always checking in with yourself and seeing where you're at. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Clarissa. D digging into kind of the emotional side of things a little more, slight, slightly different question here. Um, Somebody saying, when you're recovering the fall of Afghanistan, you spoke multiple times with the Taliban. I was nervous watching these interactions, but how did you remain so calm? So kind of, you know, not only the the seeing uh, painful mm -hmm. events happen, but in the moment, how do you how do you stay calm and in the moment? So there's two things I would say. First of all, I had spent a bit of time with the Taliban right before Kabul fell. I had just spent three days with them in the province of Ghazni. And two years before that, I had spent a few days with them in the north of the country. And so I felt pretty, I mean, comfortable with the Taliban. I mean, maybe as a stretch, but like I felt like I understood how they behaved and what the parameters were for engagement with them. I was working with a colleague who's British Afghan um, called Najibullah Qureshi, who has been working with the Taliban for 20 years, who understands them very well. Um, and so I deferred to him in terms of how to engage, how hard to push, when to question, when to shut up, when to cover my face, when to not, you know, et cetera. Um, beyond that, I think that I'm one of these people when I am very stressed and when I am maybe like nervous or scared, I don't like flap. I get like very like quiet. Um, so I can appear to be incredibly calm when that is not necessarily a reflection of my inner state. And I remember doing this live shot outside the airport and all these people were coming up to us, you know, with all their paperwork. And there was just like nonstop gunfire. And like, I was definitely, um, I mean, freaked out is strong. I wouldn't say I was freaked out, but I was nervous. I was very aware that it was a volatile, chaotic situation. I was uncomfortable with the gunfire. I was nervous about having too many people in the crowd. I was trying to focus on like 10 different things at once. But when you watch the live shot, you're like, yeah, I mean, I'm just like seeing completely, completely calm because that's just my way of dealing with fear. It's a useful way of dealing with it, I guess, but yeah, it's not necessarily indicative of what is going on internally. Wow, yeah, that's uh, very impressive. Um, we have a question here from um, Amanda who says that you're one of her role models in the industry. Oh, thanks, um, Amanda. Uh, independent journalist in Shanghai, China, and the US. Um, so specifically about the book, it, it seems like you have such a detailed timeline. Did you actively journal throughout your time as a correspondent? Oh, uh, no, I didn't. I'm terrible about journaling and diaries. And what I did do when I was in Baghdad, um, when I was younger, when I was whatever, 25 to like 27, 28, during that phase of my life, I would send these emails, group emails to like family and close friends talking about my experiences. Um, and those emails really saved me, actually, because I remember a lot from Baghdad, but not every, I mean, it was, you know, 16 years ago now. So it was a really long time ago. And so having those emails was very helpful to like jog my memory and to allow me to kind of expand on certain periods. Syria, I just felt it so intensely and lived it so closely that I remembered it vividly. Um, the toughest time for me to write about were um, my two years in China and covering it because I had been doing it long enough that I wasn't sending the emails anymore because I was a bit more jaded, but it was long enough ago that a lot of my members, so, you know, a big part of writing this book was like going back and watching every piece I had ever done, going back and reaching out to every producer I had ever worked with, every fixer, every, I mean, like, and um, yeah, that is time consuming. Um, so I would encourage people to journal. It will make <laughs> it will make your life a bit easier. But I also totally understand that, like you know, for me, if I spend my whole day dealing with war and whatever, when I have half an hour, if I have half an hour before going to bed, I want to watch Netflix. You know, I, I don't want to journal about war. <laughs> so it's a tough one. Yeah, that, that makes uh, total sense. Um, so I guess sort of related to emails, putting your notes down. Somebody's asking about uh, social media. 
which I mm. guess throughout your career, you have seen that become a really important part of yeah. you. But um, have you ever held back in social media posts or coverage for fear of harassment? Oh, for fear of harassment. I mean, I got harassed so much in Syria. It was like, it just became, in the beginning, it was very disturbing. I mean, people would talk about shooting me in the head and feeding me to pigs and how I love terrorists and like on and on. And, and, and it was ugly and it was scary. At a certain point, you get used to it um, and you just sort of get on with it. I definitely hold back on social media, though, because like the juice ain't worth the squeeze a lot of the time, you know, and first of all, it's I don't need to put myself out there. I'm a journalist. I'm an observer. My personal opinions on all these things are not necessarily um, terribly relevant or important. Um, and then beyond that, I'm like, you know, sometimes you're just opening yourself up for attack and you're not necessarily offering anything illuminating, um, to the discussion. So why bother getting involved? Um, I, I try to think of it that way. Like, do I have something to add here or no, because if I don't, then no. And I really hate Twitter, honestly. Um, I mean, Instagram is kind of fun because you can be a human being as well, but Twitter is like, to me, a kind of, I, I appreciate it as a, as an aggregator, um, of great content, but I really struggle with the kind of, um, the nastiness of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not my, it's not my go-to medium. Yeah, I uh, cannot imagine getting uh, the kind of accusations you said you got on social mm -hmm. media. Um, Amanda here is asking, um, as a foreign correspondent, how do you balance being empathetic while trying to remain unbiased in your mm -hmm. reporting? Yeah, I've always struggled with that. And I probably have been biased in some of my reporting. And I think that's why it's incumbent on news organizations if you're covering the war in Syria, you're not only going to cover it with me sitting there in rebel held areas, watching people get barrel bombed all day, because yeah, I'm going to be biased. Um, you have to also have someone on the side of the Assad regime, not to necessarily give a, a sort of rose tinted picture of, of what they're engaged in, but at least to give them an opportunity to have their say. Um, I really fundamentally believe in that. But I also believe in this idea of truthfulness and not neutrality. I don't think we need to pretend that the crimes of the rebels were the same as the crimes of the regime. They were clearly like not anything like on the same scale, but you still need to have both sides on the record. You still need to give both sides an opportunity to say their piece. And so it's really important where whatever conflict you're covering, and, and we saw this as well in like Iraq and Afghanistan and people embedded with the US military, like of course, if you're like spending all day with these U.S. soldiers or Marines who are protecting you and feeding you and going through like horrifying experiences with you and getting blown up with you, like, yes, you're going to be biased towards them. You are not going to want to do a piece at the end of it that excoriates them. Um, and so it can be challenging. But I think the first step is like be aware of the bias. Be cognizant of that. Stop pretending that it, that it doesn't exist and that you're like, you know, a superhuman journalist who is completely impervious um, to very natural human emotions. Like understand that the bias is there and own up to it. Because I think actually what viewers and readers and listeners want more from us is not that we be these superhuman neutral arbiters of, uh, you know, events, but that we be honest about, okay, this is what I see, but I'm telling you, I'm seeing this from this side and I am affected, I am moved by what I have seen. And so take what I say as being true, but also understand it through the prism of the experience that I have, which is not a holistic experience, but this slice of something. So I think that as long as you're honest about it and transparent about it, um, there's nothing wrong with being um, affected by by what you're seeing or by the the suffering of others. It's really fascinating. Yeah, we have another question in here uh, asking if there are particular challenges come with being primarily a broadcast journalist versus a print journalist. Yes, uh, <laughs> we have so much stuff. 
You know, if I'm a print journalist, I got my pen and my pad. I'm ready to go. Put on my headscarf. Instead, I've got like a big camera and, you know, at least three people and microphones going back and forth. And uh, yeah, it's it's much more difficult to be inconspicuous um, when you are a television journalist and that does have challenges. And too often we find, uh, particularly if you're covering a protest or something, that instead of being an observer, you become part of the story and you attract people. People see you, they see the camera and they come and they want to talk. And on the one hand, that's very exciting and it can be like very spontaneous and authentic. But on another hand, it's uncomfortable because it's like, no, I'm just supposed to be observing here. I'm not supposed to be the center of the story. Thank you for that, Clarissa. So somebody uh, is asking, can you give a piece of advice to people in school right now who want to make a change, but are not too sure where they, where they fit into the puzzle of change making? <laughs> Um, hmm. that's a good one. I mean, honestly, I feel like, and maybe this isn't going to be a popular answer, but if you want to make change, you've got to stop standing on the sidelines and wringing your hands and wondering what to do. And you just need to like find a direction and move forward. And you're not going to change the whole world. You may have very limited, um, ability to change anything, frankly. I, I, I certainly don't feel like I, I've succeeded in changing much. But the point is more that what you need is focus. You have to have laser-like focus to achieve anything, frankly, but particularly if you want to uh, be able to change something or, or have some kind of an impact. And there will be people along the way being like, you can't do this. This isn't done. This is outrageous. You're so egotistical. Who do you think you are? And that, 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 and like endless and obstacles. And like, honestly, you kind of have to be like a steamroller and you're just moving forward, moving forward. And sometimes at a glacial pace, but you just keep going. If you get too caught up in intellectualizing things and trying to figure out where you fit in and, and trying to think about what you can, like, then you're, you're losing the battle. Try to center yourself and focus on where you feel drawn to, where you feel something resonates with something inside you and find that thread and just pull and see where you end up. It's not necessarily a linear process, and it's not necessarily, I think part of the reason people get overwhelmed is they're like, I want to make change. How do I do that? Do, like, you can't know the end. Just find the thread and go on the journey and things will reveal themselves. You can't predict the outcome. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's my experience. Thank you, Clarissa. I think we have time for one more question. Really appreciate uh, this wonderful discussion that you're having with the audience. Um, so I think a great final question that we got is, um, if one thing only, what do you wish to leave as your journalistic legacy um, up until this point so far? Listen, I really would love for people to listen to each other, even when we don't agree with each other, even when it's painful, even when we find that the things that are being said challenge our values, they make us angry. We really need to grow up um, about having the strength um, of character to be able to listen to people who we don't agree with. And that's a, a quality that I see being eroded dramatically day by day. We have far less tolerance for people who do not um, think the way we think or dress the way we dress or shop the way we shop or whatever it is. And so um, I really hope that we can continue to listen. Um, and then the only other thing is like, be curious. And that's not something you can actually will. Um, it, I think it's a natural thing, but it's hugely important. It's what makes this job exciting. It's easy to get cynical as you go, through it, especially after doing it for many years. 
but try to have fresh eyes, try to stay curious. And, and, and when you really sit and listen, you will learn so much and, and, and so much that you thought you already knew and you, you, you didn't know it at all. And that's why listening is actually also a form of humility. Like be humble. It's not going to hurt you. You're going to learn. It's a good thing. Clarissa, you're fascinating. Um, we've all mesmerized, and I was watching the numbers. No one has left since you came. <laughs> so it's it's been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you to both you and Lucy and Carlo for asking all the questions. Um, I just wanted to read what Ames actually said, because I don't think you read it out. He said, oh, he, uh, I'm 11 years old. I love your book. <laughs> the biggest fan. So oh. I think that um, all of us are big fans of yours. So anyone who wants to join uh, UNA New York, you can. Um, we are on the, on, at unanyc.org. Um, so I hope you can join us and join us for some other programs. And by all means, if you haven't read this book, uh, please read it. It's fascinating. I really, it's one of the best books I've read. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much, Lucy and Carlo and Anne. I really, and all of you uh, who joined us, I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed the conversation and um, wishing everyone happy holidays. Thank, thank you. you so much, Clarissa. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Carlo. <laughs> thank you all. And now we have one more one more slide here, um, Carlo. We have our next uh, book talk is January 19th, and that will be on uh, Angela Merkel with Katya Marton. So I hope you can join us. So thank you all. And thanks, Clarissa, Lucy, and Carlo. Happy holidays.